This is part two of the lecture on imaging of deep neck infections. Here's another potential source of infection, the temporal bones. Although there is mastoiditis bilaterally, on the left it's particularly concerning in appearance. We've lost the normal septations that separate the different mastoid air cells, as we see, in fact, thickened on the contralateral side. On the affected side, all of these septations have been destroyed, eroded away, and this is a coalescent mastoiditis. This is, of course, a surgical emergency and requires a phone call when you see it. This is another way in which the temporal bone can be a source of infection. In addition to the mastoiditis that we're seeing here, there's a really critical finding on this image, and that is that the external auditory canal is completely packed with material. And more importantly, there are erosions all through that external auditory canal. The walls of the external auditory canal have been eroded. That lets us know that this is a specific type of infection. This is malignant otitis externa, or necrotizing external otitis if you prefer. This is an aggressive infection that begins within the external auditory canal, but erodes through the wall and famously tracks along the skull base, knocking out cranial nerves at their exit points, their exiting foramina, as it traverses from lateral to medial across the skull base. This can be a very difficult infection to eradicate in immunocompromised patients and is a very important finding on CT to identify the source of the infection. This also prompts us to get an MRI to evaluate the extent of disease and set a baseline for future MRI to evaluate the effectiveness of therapy. Okay, here's another source of infection. We don't think of lymph nodes as a source of infection. We think of them as a response to infection. But sometimes a lymph node, while trying to fight infection, will become overwhelmed. We call that a separated lymph node. And this is an example of, of lymph node separation. You can see the enlarged reactive retropharyngeal node on the left. In its expected position on the right, there is an abscess, and this lymph node has become overwhelmed by infection and become an abscess. This is essentially an exclusively pediatric diagnosis. It is very rare to see lymph node separation in adults. This is another potential source of infection. Here we see abscesses surrounding the mandible and in the upper neck, in the submandibular triangle. You can see how extensive this infection is with surrounding cellulitis, thickening of the platysma muscle, lots of infiltration of the fat planes, and extensive infection. But what's the source? Well, we'll switch over to the bone windows. And on the bone windows, we can see that this patient is actually a trauma patient. There is a fracture running through the body of the mandible. But this fracture is not acute. You can see the periosteal reaction, the bridging um, bone that has started to uh, emerge as this heals. But this is not healing well. Instead of bridging bone across the medullary cavity, we see expansion of the erosion in the medullary cavity, and you can begin to see some additional erosions where that fracture should be healing. And in fact, once we see that, we might recognize that the periosteal reaction that we're seeing around this fragment of the bone, perhaps that's not bridging bone from a healing fracture, but is instead the periosteal reaction that we associate with osteomyelitis, that is to say, a Codman's triangle. This is, in fact, superinfection of an underlying traumatic injury. When we have trauma to the mandible, we often lacerate the overlying mucosa, and this is a potential mechanism of spread of infection from the oral cavity into the soft tissues or into the bone, as in this case. So this is osteomyelitis with extensive surrounding cellulitis and abscess, all as a result of 
a traumatic mandibular fracture. This is another example of superinfection of an underlying lesion. This is a 72-year-old woman who came in with an anterior neck infection, and sure enough, you can see thickening of the platysma muscle. You can see infiltration of the fat planes. There truly is an infection going on here. And this is the abscess that has formed. But this abscess is forming in a characteristic location of another type of pathology. This cystic mass is embedded within the strap muscles of the anterior neck, and we know that that should trigger thoughts of thyroglossal duct cyst. And that's exactly what this is. This is a thyroglossal duct cyst that's been quiescent for 70 years and finally has decided to become super infected and c come to clinical intention because of that super infection. So even though this woman is 70 years old, we're still going to call this an infected thyroglossal duct cyst. Here's another example of superinfection of an underlying lesion. We can see a very angry looking inflammatory mass here in the upper neck. It's got thick walls from recurrent superinfection, but you can see that there's also an acute infection going on with thickening of the platysma muscle and infiltration of the surrounding fat planes. But if, as we look at this complex mass more carefully, we can see that it actually extends superiorly into the floor of mouth. And it has this elongated configuration along the inside of the mandible that we associate with a ranula. So this is in fact a super infected plunging ranula. Here's another example of super infection in an underlying cystic structure. There's an abscess here in the medial right orbit with a thick enhancing wall and a central area of abscess formation and extensive surrounding cellulitis, both retrobulbar and preceptal. There's nothing like that on the other side. But this is a characteristic location of a normal cystic structure. This is where the na nasolacrimal sac normally lives. And this is, in fact, superinfection of the nasolacrimal sac. We call this a dacrocystocele, or in this case, a, a superinfected dacrocystocele with abscess. So now let's ask ourselves, What's the best modality for the evaluation of deep neck infection? Is it CT? Is it MR? Is it Panorex? Well, Panorex is sometimes useful for identifying a source of infection, but it's really trumped by CT when you know that an infection is there. You'll still identify those infected teeth on the CT, and the CT will give you much better assessment of extent of disease. It turns out that CT and MRI both have advantages. For CT, it is evaluation of the teeth if those are a suspected source. For MRI, it's a little more sensitive for the soft tissue extent. Either one of them is appropriate for evaluation of deep space neck infections. In patients who are unable to receive intravenous contrast, MRI is definitely pre preferred. So let's talk about differentiating abscesses versus phlegmons. Abscesses tend to have a thick rim of enhancement, whereas phlegmon tends to have vague enhancement or lack of a true wall. The degree of low attenuation is different between an abscess and a phlegmon. They both are low att attenuation centrally, but an abscess tends to be of even lower attenuation than a phlegmon. Configuration is one of my favorite words, and you'll find it throughout all my lectures, because the configuration is almost always the best clue for differentiating things like this. An abscess is under tension, and so an abscess tries to form a sphere as best it can within the restrictions around it, whereas a phlegmon retains the normal configuration of the underlying space that it is in. It is expanded, enlarged, but it tends to retain a familiar underlying configuration. Abscess becomes spherical. The presence of gas 
within the collection strongly suggests abscess rather than phlegmon, and in fact specifically suggests anaerobic bacteria as a source. So how good are all of these distinguishing characteristics? Well, according to literature, not that good. We are not that good as radiologists at distinguishing between abscess and phlegmon. What does that mean? That means that you are going to send your surgeons in to drain an abscess, and sometimes they're only going to find a phlegmon. And that's okay. You and the surgeon have to understand the limitation of imaging and understand that sometimes a phlegmon is going to be overcalled as an abscess and unnecessary surgery will take place. I would argue that those unnecessary surgeries are still helpful to the patient in that they change the oxygen tension of the collection, but it is unsatisfying to the surgeons to go in and not drain out pus. Here are some examples differentiating abscess and phlegmon. In this example, this is a classic abscess. There is a visible, thick, enhancing rim. The central area is extremely dark. It is spherical in configuration, give or take the fact that it can't move the underlying bone, but the portion of it that has a choice is spherical in configuration. This is a classic appearance for an abscess. This is a classic appearance for a phlegmon. Here we see no enhancing rim around the collection. There are a few foci of enhancement, but these are displaced vessels. There's no true wall around this collection. Although the central area is of low attenuation, it's not as low attenuation as the abscess that we were just looking at. One of the most important features here is the configuration of this collection. It retains a more or less rectangular configuration reminiscent of the normal shape of the potential retropharyngeal space. So this is a canonical example of a retropharyngeal space phlegmon. That's the end of part two of this lecture series. In the next part, we will focus on complications of deep space infections.